Okay, so good morning, everybody. I've already introduced myself. My name's Kate Pilford. I'm an archivist here at the State Library. And if you're one of these uh, technical persons, um, you can tweet, if you like, on the History Festival um, Twitter feed, or we've got our own there as well, if you're interested in doing that kind of thing. Um, but we'll just get into it. And I just wanted to say again, welcome to you all here at the library today, and thank you for coming. And um, already you said you're enjoying the History Festival, so that's really good. Um, and I wanted to also just thank Peter Jenkins for coming today, and uh, um, it's very nice of him to come to work on a Saturday. We don't normally work on a Saturday, so we're very excited to be here today. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about preserving your digital memories and caring for your digital collections today. When we first started talking about presenting a topic like this last year, we were thinking, oh, we'll get a few people to come along. The first time we did it, we had about, I think, 80 people came. So it's definitely a, a topic in need of discussion. So thanks for coming to talk to us about that today and perhaps your experiences too. Um, we aim for you to leave today with some new and helpful tips about how to preserve your digital memories so you can start at home straight away. So something about me, I'm an archivist, meaning an information professional who assesses, collects, organises, preserves, maintains control over and provides access to records and archives determined to have long-term value. And part of my role is to cura curate material for online and physical exhibitions as well. Uh, in my spare time, I'm also a visual artist and a mum. And I've been an archivist here at the library since 2004. So I've got a little bit of experience now, but probably not an expert as some of my other colleagues are. Uh, and as well as our published collections and websites, the State Library collects a variety of unpublished material, including personal records, business records, maps and charts, and records of societies relating to South Australia and South Australians. For example, we have the personal papers and sketchbooks of Colonel William Light, farm records of Bungaree Station in the Mid-North, in Clare, uh, of um, South Australian records of the post-war detective society, society called the South Australian Red Cross Information Bureau. And here is an example of one of the 8,000 packets of soldiers' inquiry files in that uh, archival group. I've worked across most of the 60 linear kilometres of our archival collection material. I've got a background in art history and fine arts, and I've been a lecturer and a tutor. I've done training in digital preservation and digital forensics. Sounds impressive. Well, I'm actually here with a bit of a, co a, bit of a confession. Yes, it's true, I'm an archivist with some experience, but even though I've built a career in this area, I have a lot of knowledge about preserving digital material. My stuff at home is not good. <laughs> um, and I still have photos and papers that I need to get organised. I just keep putting it off at home. Um, actually, I might be the worst organised person in the world. So I'm, I'm really glad that I shared that with you. I feel a bit better now. Okay, so yes, I will be talking about some of the digital preservation theory, which can be a li little bit on the boring side. I sort of... Uh, said that earlier. There's some interesting but boring stuff as well. Um, so don't worry, I'll be showing you an easy to follow life cycle model um, with five simple steps. But to make it more interesting for you and to remind and commit myself to the idea, I thought I might take you on a little journey and illustrate some of the sticky theory with my own experiences some State Library archive examples and some photos. And you'll see that we might be in a similar boat, or perhaps you're a lot more organised than I am. Um, and incidentally, all of these slides and all the notes, all the links, they're all available on our website, so don't feel like you have to take reams of notes right now. Um, I'll give you that information. I've got a couple of bookmarks uh, around there, but I'll provide all of that to you. Yeah, it's all here. So here's a young me. Late 1975, early 1976 in Dulwich. And here's me with my mum, Alexandra. So just from those two photos, you know a little bit about, about me already, right? 
Um, our photo albums, letters, home movies and paper documents tell who we are and are a vital link to the past. The personal information we create today has the same value. The only difference is now much of it is digital. So we're using email, Word documents, digital cameras, smartphones, tablets, social media, you name it. We're using a lot more of that these days. It's likely you will want to keep some digital photos, email, websites and other files so that you and your family can look at them now and in the future. Have you thought about what might have you thought about what you might have in your own collections at home? For instance, where's your VCR wedding video? And can you still access it? Can you can you watch it? Uh, family picnics or reunion photos. Overseas trips, photos of that, honeymoon, uh, school yearbooks perhaps. Where are your baby photos? Do you still have some? What photos do you have sitting around at home and on which devices are they just sitting on? And where are your important documents, so your wills, those kind of documents? Uh, have you thought about where or to whom you want your things to go after you die? Those are the kind of things that are interesting to think about in this context. So digital preservation is different to physical preservation. It's more complex and more time imperative. Unlike a physical object that could be left alone for a long time and probably would still be in a usable, readable state, if a digital object is left alone, it could suffer a far worse fate. It needs monitoring and protection to guarantee its usability in the future. Archivists and librarians are charged with permanently preserving and providing access to records of historical value, like this shipboard diary, it's from the State Library collection, of William Taylor from the Phoebe, and it's from 1845, as it nicely tells you in the, the top um, right-hand side, almost corner, um, which, among other things, lists rations served on board, so it's full of information about that era and that experience. But are we still really on the beginning, at the beginning of learning all the techniques required to digitise and do this for digital material? You never know who might want to read your diary in 100 years' time. So according to IBM, we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day. So much, in fact, that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone. And that was a quote from last year, almost last year. So the mind boggles. You can't even can sort of um, conceptualise how much data there is being created in just in a year's time. So more digital content is being created now, more than ever before. You may have heard this phenomenon being referred to as the digital deluge. You might have seen that somewhere. We have more information today than at any other point in history, but it's more fragile than we imagine. There are 1,000-year-old books that can still be easily read, but how many of your 25-year-old floppy disks can you read or even access or even use at all? We know preserving digital information is an ongoing process, but how do we do it? Digital material itself has a conceptual roots in paper-based material, in that paper came first. Digital files are born of zeros and ones, or binary code, as we know it, the building blocks of any digital file. Survival of your digital material is reliant upon how well you maintain, treat it and care for it, like this tree of digital formats. So, me again with the watering can. <laughs> this time it's about 1978 and I'm in Semaphore. A regularly watered and cared for tree is more likely to be enjoyed by future generations if it is maintained and protected from threats and bugs. Same goes for your digital material. Digital objects are more fragile than we imagine, and once lost, they can be lost forever. Protecting your digital collections against potential risks and threats is an important step. But a downside to digital innovation is, as formats die, we lose our past. And here are some uh, customers using an old Mac PC in the Library Computer Resource Centre, and this is about 1996. So it's not really that long ago, but in that time, so much has been created, it's hard to fathom that. Like floppy disks of the past, information stored on USB sticks, on shared drives, or in the cloud, 
is so easily lost, changed or corrupted that we risk losing decades of knowledge if we do not figure out how to manage it properly. Digital records are much more complex than paper records. Not only do uh, we need computer hardware, we also need various software programs that run on various operating systems in order to be able to view a document on a computer screen. Here I am again. I'll feature, I feature a lot in this presentation. Hopefully it gives you some context of a, a cycle, a life cycle. Um, holding here two photo prints on a, made on a, an instant Polaroid camera. Do you remember those? I used to love being able to use that. I was allowed to sometime. And this year is approximately 1980. I'm in the backyard of my family home in Dulwich. And these two prints I'm holding had just been taken at the same time of the picture you're looking at, which I've just had digitised for this presentation. So this is part of those three. So it's interesting. It's just an interesting um, way to, to look at those digital files now. So I'm going to have a little bit of a break here and have a pause. And uh, we thought we might give you a moment to visualise your collections at home, if you're not already doing that. Um, and think to yourself, is, everyone, is everything in one place? Or have you got some in the shed, some in another room, some in the cellar? <laughs> you know, you could be anywhere. Um, and like me, you haven't got everything in one place and you're not too sure where everything is. And feel free to ask any questions <coughs> at this time or chat amongst yourselves or think of any examples that you might like to talk about later. And while you're doing that, I'll just show you this other slide and tell you a little bit about the State Library building. So we're gathered in the Institute building here of the State Library and it was built for the South Australian Institute which was established in 1856 and was designed by the colonial architect Edward Hamilton. And this is an image of the circulating library which backs onto this room. I think some of you might have seen it inside there. It's a pretty amazing um, place in there. Lots of things have been filmed in there, all sorts of events. Um, yeah, it's a great little room. Originally, the Adelaide Circulating Library housed the Library of South Australian Mechanics Institute and books in the South Australian Subscription Library, from which only subscribers could borrow. The Subscription Library became a separate institution called the Adelaide Circulating Library in 1884, and when the Public Library, Museum and Art Gallery replaced the SA Institute. So that's just sort of just to give you a break from the presentation bit, some interesting information. Did you think of anything that you've got at home that you've sort of worried about that might be becoming obsolete or not being able to access those things? Yeah, I've, I've got lots of things myself. Okay. You might recognise this lady. Jermaine Greer once said, archives are the pay dirt of history. Everything else is opinion. At a certain point, you actually need documents. A recent article published in The Guardian has revealed that author Jermaine Greer has a very substantial and representative archival collection going back to the early 1950s until now. She continues to um, contribute to the archive as well, so it continues to grow. And this is a particularly interesting collection because it comprises papers created on a variety of different platforms and a similar amount of diverse software programs arising in a multitude of different file formats created on whatever was state of the art at the time. She was really into using the latest technology. So you can imagine um, that means that she's got lots and lots of different file formats, lots and lots of different types of um, hardware that she's used as well. So how, how does an archive manage that or how does a, a, an individual manage that? And her collection is a great example of a writer's archive, but it might not be vastly unlike your own. If you've used Mac and PC and different types of things, you might have different types of files. How do you manage all of that? The archivists and librarians at the Melbourne University are currently working on arranging, describing and preserving her archive using digital preservation software and digital forensic solutions. So were you able to visualise a couple of memory items at home? I'm thinking about your collections at home. You might have some CDs, DVDs, old laptops, 
maybe some five and a quarter inch floppy disks. You might have zip disks, zip disk drives, cameras, photo albums, videos, video cameras, film reels, slides, you name it. You might have all of those things. Maybe a mini disk, that's another one. Um, what about musical, um, digital music notation? My husband Tom is a composer and has, has hundreds of original charts written on the Sibelius notation program, which I suspect exists in suspended animation. He wouldn't have backed it up or printed it out or anything at all. So it's just sitting on his laptop and that's it. <laughs> so I shudder to think what could happen to all of that work. So what is digital preservation? Okay, I'm gonna do some theory now, so bear with me. Um, Digital preservation is the set of processes, activities and management of digital information over time to ensure its long-term accessibility. There are some key challenges we must keep in mind. Understanding that digital information is fragile in nature and is highly susceptible to loss, alteration and corruption that file formats, media formats, software and hardware can become obsolete, which means pretty much you can't use it at all, uh, threatening accessibility and use. The lack of description in your metadata may make the records difficult to find, identify and interpret. Rapid technological change makes it difficult to keep on top of changing technology. So that example of Germaine Greer's archive, she's probably um, had new software, new technology every couple of years and uh, it hasn't even become obsolete or threatened in that time, but she's used lots of different things, which is another challenge. Um, so we need to be able to preserve the accessibility of your digital memories as well as understand standard tools and practices, protect your data, store your digital objects safely which we think means having at least two identical digital objects stored in two separate locations. So if one fails, you've got the other one. So what is metadata anyway? And what is a digital object? When we talk about managing your files, we refer to digital objects. The object may be one file or it may be a bundle of files like this little package. This may include any type of content. It could have images, text, sound, videos, and maps. A digital photograph is a digital object. Or an email may be comprised of a few different things. It may have a JPEG for the image, another file for the written contact, content, another file for pagination, and um, that defines what order the pages go in. So lots of different things within the digital object to make one object. A website is a great example of a digital object as it could contain all of these things and more. All of these are separate examples of digital objects. So I keep talking about metadata, but what is that? I love note to the future. That's one way of describing it. It's structured information associated with an object for the purposes of discovery, description, use, management, and preservation. So we want you to, would we advise you to, uh, label your files, descriptive file names are best, tag your photos with names, places, or other meaningful information, like uh, geocode or geodata, GIS data is good if possible, so you, you know exactly where the photo was taken. So if you've got a camera that has that function, digital camera, turn that function on when you take when you're making new uh, photographs because then we can tell exactly where you took the photograph with the GIS code. Sounds very technical but it's reasonably simple if it's all in the metadata. Another example of metadata you might like to think about is your address, your physical address at home is metadata about your home, your house. The street name puts you close to the house but by adding the street number it gives you a more accurate location where that is. Speaking of homes, here I am in leg warmers outside our house in Clare in the mid north of South Australia. My father managed the savings bank of South Australia here on the main street of Clare and my actual home address at the time was the bank itself and we lived in the residence that was at the back of the bank building which my sister and I thought was fantastic because we can, can peep into the bank and pretend that we owned all the money and 
have a look at the, the stationary collection and steel pencils and things like that. <laughs> it was really fun at the time. So this is my Claire primary photo, uh, and I think it was about 1983 or 1984. I think I was in a bit about year three or four. So if we were to describe in detail this location today, we could pick up the exact GIS coordinates. If I was taking a photo today, you'd know exactly where that is. But because we know it's the main street of Clare, it's the bank building, that's easy to find that um, if you wanted to describe that further. So I've talked about a life cycle model. I promised to show it to you, and here it is. It's an easy to follow life cycle model with five simple steps. So just like us, a digital material has a natural life and can be explained by using this life cycle model. It is important to think of digital preservation as an ongoing program, not just a one-time project. So it's something that you need to go back to and sort of follow around in a cyclical way. For preserving your digital memories, we can think of it as this five-step process. So you identify your material, you decide what you want to keep, you organise that, make copies of that and then store that and then you just keep doing that so it's just a simple way to think of it instead of thinking where do I start so that's one way that we recommend um, my apologies I couldn't find my high school photos they're somewhere in a box somewhere I don't know where they are don't tell my mum she'll be a bit upset <laughs> um, so flash forward a year or two from my primary school photo and it's 2002 and here I am at my graduation at Adelaide University, just over here somewhere, with my grandmother and my younger sister, Mary. My grandmother, Anna, was born in Ukraine, so we called her Babushka, or Baba. So your things at home. Keep in mind, as I show you some more ideas, you need to identify all your digital photos on cameras, computers, removable media like memory cards, Identify valuable analogue prints and slides that you might want to create digital versions of. Don't forget to include any of your photos on the web. So if you're a Facebook user, perhaps don't preserve the Facebook photo, but try and find the original photo because it will be a much better quality photo with more data. Facebook tends to strip all the metadata out of the photo. Um, what other kind of things are important to you to save? For example, you might have any kind of documents, your tax file things, depending on uh, disposal, I think that's every seven years or so. Um, correspondence, email, things like that. Um, wheels, wheels are always a big one. So identify these things with a list. This is an Arcadian language clay tablet from the State Library collection. It has a list of names which can be inscribed, or sorry, which has been inscribed in cuneiform. It's approximately uh, from 2400 to 2300 BC. We can still read it, can't we? Not like a floppy disk. Anyway, <laughs> unlike this cuneiform tablet, which might take a little while for you to carve up, your shopping list could easily be created with a piece of paper and a pen. Or a simple Word document. That's pretty easy too. It's great to know what digital content you might have in your home and this can be done through creating a shopping list or a simple uh, folder or item list on your computer of all the things you have. You might just sort of go through all the things you have and forget that you've had something in a different box or a different area in the house. If you make an overarching list of everything you have, then you can kind of look at it as a whole, as a context, and break it down from there. Understanding where your collections are now and where you should be storing your most valuable items is a good way to start. So, here are Tom and me on our special day, 2013. Feels like a while ago now, it's four years ago. This image was taken outside our home in Croydon, which has the 1912 shop front. So we've got a shop front house and the side has still got the bushels um, tea sign painted. You can still see it there. Um, so that's interesting and, it, and one of the reasons we bought the house. We love that house. Perhaps more than any other kind of personal digital information, photos have rich personal meaning and they're unique. If they're lost, the information they provide can never be replaced for that moment in time. You will want to keep at least some of your digital photos for a really long time. Focus your attention on organising your important photos by placing them into related and meaningful groups. For example, you might have on your desktop 
wedding photo, wedding folder, something like that. Now, moving to digital, don't forget your analog photos that you want to digitise. You might have lots of digital files already, but what about the analog stuff that's sitting there that you want to keep and be able to access going forward if, if they're lost or you want to also have that as part of your collection? The format itself isn't the most important part of that, even though it comes from analog. So digitisation is the process of converting diverse analogue media, including images, documents, film, sound or voice, to digital form. Make sure you know the standards for digitising, and within the, the links which I'll show you, we'll have some sets of standards for you to follow, I won't tell you them all now, too much information. But just quickly, for example, uh, for scanning photos, save as TIFF for your master image. TIFF's got everything. It's, um, or JPEG 2000 is acceptable for a master, but TIFF has all the metadata behind it. It's a much richer quality than a JPEG, plain JPEG, for example, or a PNG file or something small like that. And be methodical. Do the same thing you do for one file than you do for the others, so you, everything has the same treatment if you can manage it. Make sure you name your files in a meaningful way that's meaningful to you, and make sure they sit in a file structure that makes sense to you so, you know, use a, a numerical system or a name system, something that makes sense to you that's easy to remember as well. And be consistent in that. A little planning goes a long way and it also helps to provide context so you can uh, uh, provide more meaning by having a context in that arrangement. So after you scan, create a master file and a copy and do your adjustments um, on the copies, don't work on the masters, keep the masters safe and preserved. <coughs> so, we're coming up to a, a, a break slide in a sec, but I'll just go through this just in case, you probably know all this already, but it's just good to list it out. So, what are digital items anyway? What do they encapsulate, what can they be? Born digital photographs are photographs created digitally on cameras Mobile phones, which I do a lot of, I just, I can't help myself. I'm taking photos all the time. My, my um, storage is always running out, so don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, tablets like your iPad, other mobile devices, anything that's created with that. Other types of born digital content you might have at home, uh, you might have an artwork that's been created on a computer, that you might even have a digital print of that that you might want to digitise back. Documents, so test, tech based documents, manuscripts and archives in digital format, moving images or film uh, made using digital cameras, music, as I mentioned before, the Sibelius notation or recorded music um, on recorded on uh, digital devices, oral histories or personal notes, dictation notes that you've kept on a dictaphone, a digital dictaphone, something like that. That's just a few examples of what you might have depending on what kind of person you are and what kind of archives you create. So a little bit of a break and a sort of a thinking slide here so you don't have to look at the screen all the time. And I'll just have a little chat to you about some interesting thing that you might not have seen before at the State Library. It's on this wall, if you've come by the library in the evening or at night time, you might see the story wall. So this is the State Library story wall, which is an interactive creative projection installation which is projected on the exterior wall of this building every night. And it's designed to engage, entertain and educate by showcasing our unique State Library South Australiana material. Um, and it's also um, accompanied with um, stories and other stories recorded along with it. So it's, it's really lovely actually. So can anyone tell me what they have and what perhaps they'd like to keep, what digital items they'd like to keep? And maybe just, just have a little think. And if you'd like to answer, ask a question, please do so now, if you'd like to. Yes, at the back. Ah, good question. So that is, if you've got something on your laptop or your PC that you want to save, do you save it to CDs, DVDs, USB? 
is that about the right sort of question? Yes, we actually are going to recommend, and I'll go into that a bit further later too, about some actual examples. But we're saying now those um, CDs, DVDs, USBs are okay as a carrier. So if you want to make a copy and give it to someone, or if you want to make a copy and take it to another laptop or device, it's good for that. But for long-term storage, we're now um, recommending that you purchase terabyte drives, those external um, terabyte drives, and we're actually saying to purchase two and make a copy on each one. So if one fails, then you've still got the backup and leave your masters on that. Um, and we, yeah, we're definitely, I mean, I need to do that for my own stuff. I keep saying that. Um, but it's a good idea. And we also recommend two different brands in case one fails, and we recommend that they're new as well. Would you, would you say that, Pete? Yeah, Pete's nodding. Um, so, yeah, new, new uh, drives that you haven't used before, so they haven't been corrupted with other files. Um, and then with those, I think it's sort of five years that you back those up again to, to new um, terabyte drives. That's really going to catch, catch all. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about some other things that you can do to alert um, damage to your files, and it's something you can do with open source um, software. It's easy to use. I'll talk to you a bit about that in a sec as well. But does that, does that answer your question? It's a very simple question. It was a good, yeah, but very direct. Thanks for that. I'll talk to you a bit more about that in a sec. Are there any other ideas? Yes. Yeah. Look, Pete's... Ah, oh, that's brilliant. Ah, oh, you get a gold star for that. That's brilliant. Excellent. <laughs> so we just... Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's very conscientious. Yeah. Absolutely. We're just saying, just for the recording, um, to those, those external terabyte drives, store them in actual physical, different physical locations as well. So maybe one in your office at work or in a... Um, uh, like a bank storage, which is a great idea. Uh, so they're not going to get damaged by... So if it's no good having them sitting next to each other if you have a fire. That's no good. Yes, there's a question here. Yes. Uh, yes, we do. We are recommending cloud storage as well as a secondary or third storage backup. So with, when you do have your terabyte drives, storage to the cloud as well with your master files is another fail fail safe um, for you to have so if you do end up losing those terabyte drive you have still got the cloud too that you can um, get back to but we do depending on who's hosting the cloud <coughs> for you um, we recommend that you regularly check to see if you can still access um, those files and for example um, you know, Google Drive things like that just make sure you can still access those because there's well, there's not much threat to them falling over but just in case have your terabyte drive um, back up as well. Yeah, you say. Does that sound right there? Pete's nodding. Oh, another question. Yes. Um, yes, I think that's the question about cloud hosting. Um, we do recommend Google Drive, and I think, is it OneDrive? OneDrive is another really, Microsoft OneDrive um, is another one. Um, and I think those two are probably the main ones. Pete, is that right? Of course. Yeah, Google Dropbox. Amazon Web Services. Yeah. Very big. Yeah, you kind of want to go with the big extensive ones that are supported all over the world, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and it's that so easy to use cloud, isn't it? So, yeah, it's good. Yeah, so Mac, Mac systems, Apple iCloud for Mac systems. Oh, okay, yes, another question. This is great. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, so that's a question about um, systems and products and which is the best thing to be using at, at the moment. Is that the kind of thing you're asking about um, what, do, what we recommend to be using? Well, I guess um, the idea is to, to use what you have, but to make sure that you are backing up regularly and that you are you, in modifying and renewing your material and your software and hardware as it, as the, as it comes out. Yeah. Well, no. Pete's no. Pete's <laughs> the better to Technology answer. changes <laughs> all the time. You've it, you just got to face up to the Thank fact. Thank you for the question. That's a very good question. Yeah. It Pete's answering. It that. will <laughs> keep changing, and as Kate had said earlier, when she said, you know, after five years, da da da, you should be able to hold out current stuff for for the next five years, just as a nominal sort of thing, but yeah. in five years' time, you've just got to review what is the technology around at the time, what equipment has become obsolete, what are the failure rates of, um, you know, some brands that turn out to be not as good as hoped, and just keep moving your data to new things all the time. Yeah. And that means that if you've got data for future generations, <laughs> those future generations are going to have to consign themselves to managing it somehow. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's a good um, question. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, that, that I will invite you to do that a bit later in the presentation. Um, yeah, it's, it's something that we are looking at right now. Literally this week, we're having meetings about how we deal with all that. So, yeah, we're, we still need to, we have a mandate to collect South Australiana material no matter what format it is. So we need to also be ahead of that. We need to think about what kind of systems are going obsolete and what kind of files and things we might anticipate to, to come into the library and how do we deal with that as, as archival. Um, we're not digital archivists but we're training to learn more about it so that kind of thing and lucky we have people like Pete Jenkins to help us <laughs> with that stuff <laughs> because it's really a huge learning curve for us too just being ahead of all of that. So I think there was a, sorry, one question back here, yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, so that, that's a question about file formats and the strategies for storing different types of file formats. I think it comes back to a little bit about what I was saying about um, thinking about the kind of list of things, like making a list of all the things that you have. And you can, for example, create yourself an Excel spreadsheet listing out the formats that you have and that's a really good way of just managing what you're using and what you have and then there will be um, and we can talk about the specific ways to to store specific file formats with you separately um, but the main way to do it is how you do it with everything else so if you've got HTML kind of um, website material that kind of thing you can store all the files that you use to create that website separately and then you can also save the HTML website as well so as a uh, in terms of the context of the archive that you've created to create that website a researcher might find that interesting the way you've created it and it might be more interesting to them than the actual website itself it just depends on who's asking about it and what so if we were if you made a fantastic website, I'm assuming you probably have, about maybe South Australiana material or some other kind of um, contextual stuff for the State Library that would fit into our collecting um, policy, then we would look at all the aspects of that website and what else you've created. Perhaps you have a huge file of different photographs of South Australia that you've used to create this website. If we look at everything and we probably would collect a sample or even the entire thing and then how we preserve it and provide access to it is a discussion we'd have with you as well if you were donating that to the library or thinking about it. Um, you know, you might not want to um, create or allow access to every part of that file process or that project, but you might want to, and then we can um, access that for other people to research as well. So 
that's how I would think about it from the archival perspective. But the, the actual um, technical perspective is, yeah, recommend making a list of all those things. And then when you get to what you want to decide to keep, then you can maybe look at that specifically on which file formats are easier to, to well, they should just be just as easy to save in your, in the cloud and in your um, terabyte drives. I'm assuming that's the way that it should work at, at this stage. And then of course you renew and review that as you go. Is that somewhere near answering the question? Oh, good, <laughs> that's good. And there was one more at the front here. if you were donating to us, do you mean? Or if, if it's in the collection we already have? Okay. Yeah, well, I'm not asking, that was a question about, I think if I understand, um, uh, would the library provide a hosting service for, no, that's probably not quite what I'm saying. So, <laughs> sorry, there are people that do that though. You've got some, um, some companies like Ancestry.com, some of those kind of, um, yes, that is. But if you, there's a different side to it, not that I'd promote it as a business that we do, but the library itself will, um, we have an appraisal process. So we would appraise your items that you were thinking about donating to the library of course, we encourage that those items would be accessed to the public. There'd be no fee for anyone to access. It's a, it's a service we provide. But um, we would then need to describe, arrange and describe that material within uh, archival standards. Um, and we might not collect all of it, but if it's a solid archive that represents South Australiana or a South Australian person, there's no reason we wouldn't collect that over a paper-based archive. The question is, how long would it take for us to actually treat it to be able to be accessed? And there's probably a lag, because we have so much stuff to, we've got so much work to do. <laughs> yes. But does that kind of answer your question? But there are, there are uh, companies that host those things. Yes. Yeah. I should go into a business. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. It sounds, it's a lot of work. I know it is. And I'm sure there are. There are businesses that do that. I know that the, in the States, when we first started learning about um, digital preservation education, uh, we had a wonderful woman, Mary Molinaro from Kentucky Archive, uh, come and speak to us about um, how she started that kind of idea of personal archives. And there are p places that do host and they do digitise for you. They do all of that work for you. And there probably is a way to find that out. I could feed that back to you if you like. I'm not sure how much it costs or, yeah. It might be more lucrative to do it yourself. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting, isn't it? There's so, I mean, I've, I'm facing it myself. I've got so much to do. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'd love to, yeah. <laughs> I'll just do all the library stuff first and then I'll <laughs> And then one more question here at the front fellow. Yeah. I am. Yes, I am. Don't worry, it's coming up. All right, let's get back into that part. Unless any other burning questions, hold on to them and we'll have a bit more discussion time. So, where are we? Okay, back to this life cycle model. You probably get sick of this, but it's actually a really easy way just to remember those five steps and think, where am I? Have I got to that? Where do I go from here? So, it's a good place marker if you begin to feel a bit overwhelmed with all the things you need to think about with this. So here we are at, we've talked about identifying, so looking at everything that you've got in your collection. Now we're getting to how to decide which things to keep and store. How do you decide, and this might help with um, the gentleman at the front, how do you decide which things to work on? You don't have to save everything. Yes. <laughs> or maybe you want to, and then you just think about how you're going to do that. So weighing it up. Then there were three... And here's my selfie. Does anyone take selfies like me? I do a lot of selfies. And we're here in my uh, home in Croydon, late 2013, about to pop. And shortly after, on the 30th of October 2013, 
Here's me with my husband Tom and a new baby, James Ellington Pulford, our little boy Jimmy, as we know him. And just like my hefty picture here, we need to weigh things up. Once you've identified all those things that you've got in your home, in your cellar, in your car, boot, um, and what treasures you have, you've got to decide on which are the most important and valuable to you to keep forever. So pick the images or documents you feel are especially important, which things have long-term value. If you need to convert analog items to digital, prioritise those that are at a higher risk of degradation, fading or colour loss, you've got some old slides that are going a bit orange, things like that, try and capture those. You can pick a few photos or many, but you don't have to pick everything. Uh, if you've got 20 of the same images or something, don't pick all of them, just pick the one that has the highest quality and is the most uh, uncompressed image, so uh, that still has the most data in it. Um, that'll give you the most likely chance of it saving a good quality picture. Basically, think about how you want to prioritise your time, because it does take a lot of time um, in preserving your memories, but perhaps more than time, what's the best way to preserve your memory that is unique to you, unique to your story, and that best tells your story of your family history? Archives are unique, and everyone's story is unique to them, which can also make that material very interesting to other people later. So you never know who might look at your materials and your photographs long after you've gone. It doesn't need to be pretty. A content inventory must be functional, but it doesn't need to be beautiful. Too elaborate or take a long time to create, like our cuneiform tablet. You don't need to take you know, five days to write a list, or maybe you do, depending on how much stuff you've got, but you don't have to chip it out of stone, basically. Uh, start now, start this afternoon, if you like and make a commitment to yourself and be diligent in the future to continue that um, commitment to that. So now we know where our stuff is and we've decided on what we want to preserve, we can then organise it through creating an inventory, and I was uh, mentioning that before with the, the file formats, making a, an inventory list, or just a paper and pencil list with a few columns would be fine. An inventory's content is more important than the style and the format, so you don't do it in calligraphy pen or anything, just, just make a very simple list. Focus on making sure it will contain the content you want, rather than spending time and energy over um, making a too complicated inventory. It's meant to improve decision making and not create too much more work, so it's meant to simplify, so keep it simple. And also, easy for others to interpret if necessary. So for example, you're not able to explain what's in the list, make it just easy language or easy way to interpret so someone else can read it and understand what you're intending. Find that balance between having enough detail without going overboard. For instance, define any columns succinctly and clearly so you don't become confused. So here's one I prepared earlier. And this is an example of a very detailed personal digital memory inventory, but you don't have to go to this level. This is a bit OCD, which is you know, indicative of what I'm like. So <laughs> you don't have to do this, but it's kind of a guide of the kind of, I was talking before about file formats and perhaps locations on where you've stored them. You don't have to do this level, but it just gives you a bit of an idea. And the slide for this will be available on the web, so you can just have a look. It might suit you, it might not suit you. This is just a few things I put together. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, oh, it's a bit small, isn't it? Um, oh, okay, I'm not quite sure if I can do that from here. Oh, Pete's, Pete to the rescue, thank you, Pete. Just on the top, um, I've got, from left to right, folder name on the desktop, uh, for example, Royal Adelaide Show. And the second column is item number or file name. So that's the file name of the top one is the TIFF file that I've made. Um, the item description, very easy, baby pic, pageant photo. I put the format type, it was a digital photo and the file type was a TIFF. Um, the media type was an image, so a photograph normally is an image. Original creation date and the date I stored it. So there's a uh, what is it, a 25 year, 25 year gap between taking the image and storing it. 
Um, so you might actually do a control find in your Excel spreadsheet, look for all the photos taken in 1990. It's just a different way of, you can animate a spreadsheet like that to make lists within that. But I mean, that's over, that's overdoing it. You don't have to do, go to that extent. Um, and this, this slide is available on the link too. So, I mean, this is just a, one example. You could just have two columns. You don't have to go to this extent. Um, yeah. Uh, hand, uh, handwritten lists on paper is fine. List the folders on your desktop and the file structure within those, perhaps. Just as long as you know where your things are or so that you can give a copy it of it to someone else to explain. So the last two I've got, storage location one is my drive at work and storage location two is my drive at home. So two terabyte drives, one at work, one at home, um, just to save that. And you can have a third storage in the cloud too, if you like, if you want to have that third backup. Um, so a detailed inventory should identify all your different format types, and this is for detailed, if you want to go detailed. Recording format type information will help you identify the range and number of file types you have. So as I was explaining before, you might be able to create a list out of this document on all of your video files, and then you might look at that separately. But that's just an, an extra over-the-top way of looking at it if you, if you want to. In this example, as I've spoken about the different columns, um, yeah, use words and columns and descriptions that are meaningful to you, and that way you'll find things easier and they'll make more sense to you. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, so any more questions on that? I've got another break slide. In the, yeah. Yes. Yes, that's probably something I... <laughs> you can, you, yeah, you can, you can just have, I mean, you can just have a, a birthdays folder. That's enough. I mean, you don't have to do all of this. You don't have to do all of this at all. Uh, I think that was my list of, yeah, I think I had a list of invi um, yeah, invitations or something like that. that was it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do. Does if if that's if that's your if that suits your thinking, I think that works. That works for you. Yeah, that's good. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I kind of um, I kind of put it together just as an example of what you possibly could have, rather than what you should really have. Uh, you don't have to have it like that. You can have it much more dense, or you can have it just two lists, or whatever makes sense to you that makes it easy to find things. Um, and in this way, if you were, for example, thinking about donating it to the library, we'd have more of a sense of how you've arranged your papers as well, rather than just sort of giving us your hard drive or something like that, <laughs> which happens too. <laughs> All right, so this is um, a, just a little bit of a break and just to um, show off a bit about some other things that are happening off in, <laughs> in the library. Um, so yeah, and if you'd like to, please chat, t chat to each other about, um, or think about some other questions you might have. And I'll talk to you about one of our current exhibitions uh, called Play, which actually finishes tomorrow. So if you've got a couple of minutes after today, just um, walk out here and around up to the stairs in the treasures wall. And this exhibition is beautiful. It's a delightful collection of objects from the children's literature research collection in the library. Um, there's all sorts of things. It just reminds us of things that we've used and played with as kids. And maybe you remember some of those. There's all sorts of things like militaria, dance theatre, outdoor activity, children's clubs, Aboriginal childhood science fiction, universal toys used across generations, and fleeting found objects of play. Um, and I also thought about this and thought, uh, this exhibition includes artworks. So what about artworks as digital collection items? Artists are making more and more digital artworks too. How are they gonna treat, how are they gonna 
look after them? How are they going to treat them if they only exist as a digital object and they're either projected like this or turned into different things? I think about that. As a visual artist, that's something that I think about um, and how we're going to make those things um, last going into the future. So the list of things... Um, at your house now should be forming in your mind. So I've been talking about a lot. You're probably thinking about maybe some photos that are similar to the ones I've been showing that you might have at home. Um, so we're going to go back into that life cycle model now and do a bit more theory. So bear with me. Um, it's time to make copy. So you've organised, you've got your list, you've organised, you've selected what you want to keep forever and it's time to make copies. So make copies and store them in different places, as we've said. Make at least two copies of your selected photos. More copies are better. One copy can stay on your computer or laptop and put other copies on separate media, as we've been discussing, the portable hard drives um, or internet uh, cloud storage. Internet storage, like cloud storage, can be hosted by a variety of providers, as we've mentioned, um, Google, Dropbox, um, OneDrive, those kind of things through Amazon, as we've mentioned before with Pete. Make sure you test these options to see if you can actually retrieve the content and do this regularly. So maybe set up a once every couple of months to see if you can get that content back from the cloud and see if it's okay. Uh, cloud storage is also a good way to share your content with others, especially for massive files. So if you want to send a, a digital album to someone you can do it within the cloud, just give them access to it. It's another good way of doing it. And email and physical carri carriers like USB or CDs are okay for smaller files. And we talked before about that question about using those as carriers rather than long-term storage. Don't use your DVDs or USBs as long-term storage. Yeah, only for a delivery mechanism. So why do we need to make identical copies? Is it essential? Because it sort of helps you mitigate against risk, really. So if you've got two identical copies, you've always at least got one of them if one of them fails. And anything can happen. We can't prevent it all, but we can lessen the negative impact. It's important to ask, how might a disaster, natural or human, affect your personal archives at home? One of my archivist colleagues, now retired Neil Thomas, lives in a bushfire-prone area, and he's talked about, he's told the story many times, that... He has a couple of milk crates of precious items he keeps separately, near the safest exit to the building from the other household things, just in case the family have no choice but to pack up and leave quickly. And the crates, of course, contain our most precious items that we have, family photos, wills and diaries. And now I would recommend also having your terabyte drive in there if you're in that kind of bushfire zone and it's a, it's a deadly time of year. Get those things ready to take with you if you have to. Um, now, going back a couple of slides, do you remember my uni grad photo, complete with the mortarboard and everything? Well, I almost didn't get there. After a research trip to Melbourne, I arrived home to my little flat in North Adelaide. I used to have a little flat down the bottom of North Adelaide there. And I got there and the door was ajar and there was a safe hole business card on the, the table. And I just, I just had this horrible feeling. I, I realised I'd been completely burgled. My laptop was gone. All of my stuff was gone. My CDs were gone. Everything was gone. All the work I'd been doing towards my thesis was gone. It was, oh, it was just so awful. It was devastating. But thank goodness I'd recently had a meeting with my supervisor. And back in those days, it's, I mean, it's not that long ago, I'd actually printed my whole draft out, thank goodness, because I wanted to give it to her so she could read and annotate it. Um, but that's all I had left of it. So I had to retype the whole thing. I didn't have anything left of it. Um, yeah, so a bit of a fail. Anyway, I, I learnt from that. I, s I save everything now. So I said about the safe hole, SA police card. It was just awful coming into your home knowing that someone had been in there. Anyway, I uh, won't go. I'm obviously not affected by it at all. No, just joking. Uh, we can't always rely on the police. Essentially, risk management is all about proper planning and being ready for uncertainty. We cannot prevent it all, but we can lessen the negative impact. So with that in mind, let's look at a, some, a couple of other examples of potential risks and threats to digital content and ways we can mitigate them to prevent it from occurring. 
So there are lots of types of risks to your things at home. And, I mean, obvious things, easy things to predict, like obsolescence. We've talked about things going obsolete and needing to update systems and change them regularly. Um, any kind of change, that can also be a threat to your material. And things that are hard to predict, even though you might live in a bushfire zone, you can't predict when it's going to happen, so that's hard to predict. Burglary, that's hard to predict. I mean, you, you know, it's just a very unlucky um, if that were to happen. Um, and things like the recent ransomware attacks, you can't predict that. I said those kind of things, like hacking, those things, like that can affect you too. So those kind of things are things that are real these days. So there are many kinds of obsolescence. So what is it? Obsolescence to software, hardware and media. Does anyone remember the WordStar program? WordStar, yeah, there's a couple, there's always a couple who remember that one. So hardware, how many people still have and use a CD player in their laptop? Me too, I've still got one too, yeah. Um, media, five and a quarter inch floppy disks, those little ones. The 10 inch, yeah, there's so many different types. Um, and does anyone still use them or even have the stuff to read them? Because it's impossible to do that now. Yeah, <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, so all are interrelated and you need one to read the other. You need the software and the hardware to read each other to interpret and access them. So this is also um, indicative of what's unique to you and what's also worth preserving. You can't prevent data loss from obsolescence. Well, sometimes you can, but it requires being proactive and planning, which is why, the, why it's important to list our different file types in our inventory. So some are more... Um, uh, susceptible to obsolescence than others. The older ones are more susceptible than the newer ones. So having that listed is, is one of the reasons for listing it. Active and ongoing tracking of your digital information will significantly reduce the risk of your information becoming obsolete and inaccessible. Reformatting endangered file types will help greatly towards keeping them accessible and usable. So it's important to remember that all media eventually will become obsolete. There are many useful lists out there and you can access this on the slide too. The National Library of Australia has one available on their website of all going obsolete um, media. So that's a good way to see if you've got any of those things, maybe think about um, there on your list to do first to, to um, provide uh, digitisation to first. So we can't stop change. It's constant and iterative. Iterative, sorry. As things grow, they change, and change is constant. In other words, it has a cycle of life. There is a risk to not being able to identify changes and the possible loss of digital content. Accidental or deliberate deletion of ob objects, accidental changes to files, unintended conversions, these are all possible scenarios. So here's an example. You're trying to create a duplicate of a photo and during the process, something goes wrong and the file's been altered, the file's changed. But how do you know it's been changed? You might not know it's been changed. You might not even see it, but something's changed in the file. This is what I was talking to you. I was saying earlier about what you can do to track those things. You could perform a fixity check, which means demonstrating that content is unchanged using a checksum. And a checksum acts like a unique fingerprint of the file. It sounds a bit scary. It's a bit of digital forensics, but don't be too scared. It's really easy. It's actually a simple process that can be achieved with open source software such as WinMD5. So you can just install that and use that. Basically, a checksum acts as an early warning that something's changed within the file. It won't fix the problem, but it will alert you to any degradation or data loss in the file. Ideally, the checksum shouldn't change at all. It should be exactly the same. That way, the file hasn't changed at all. And you can check up, uh, you can set up your systems to do this automatically in regular intervals. Um, and then that way, you can get an early warning so you can maybe address that file and see if you can save it elsewhere. Or just save it from extra damage, further damage or obsolescence. So for your backups, remember, you must have a minimum of two copies in two locations, which means that your file, is, if your file is not recoverable in one location, you can get it from the other. I must have said that. Sorry. Oh, that will sink in. It's, yeah, <laughs> repeated that a lot. 
So none of the above risks I've talked about are static. As time changes, new challenges will emerge. So for this reason and for the reason of um, hardware and software becoming less likely to use and obsolete, um, just you've got to keep ahead of that new technology and just keep informed about the changes and new things. So there's no one catch-all, un unfortunately. So here's a bit of a break, a break again and just think about what kind of storage solution you might have and if you need to think about purchasing some external storage. And we did mention that before. So I've got you know, images of two terabyte drives there, two different brands, um, and buy new ones if you can, um, just so they haven't been used before and have corrupted files within them. Um, yeah, so you need to save identity identical copies to each external drive and make the copies from your master. So always make copies from your master and don't work and alter the master, ideally. So store, as I mentioned, uh, store two or more identical copies, ideally with the same fixity as I showed you, the same checksum, in two different locations. And if disaster strikes in one, you've got your second one and they should be safe, theoretically. And as we mentioned, one of the locations could have a third location as the cloud. So that's your third one. And also another good thing to do, that inventory list that you make, keep a copy of that with your terabyte drive too, so that kind of goes together. That's a good way to have that. And let people know where they are. Um, yeah, so just a little brief explanation of the lifespan of carriers. So we talked about there was a question about DVDs, uh, CDs and USBs and should you store things on those or we're recommending not to because they've got a short lifespan. Um, so magnetic tape has 10 to 20 years. Cassette tape, you remember those? I've still got some of those, I think. Um, 30 years. Nintendo Entertainment System video game cartridge. Has anyone got used some of those in this audience? Maybe, maybe one or two. Up to 10 years. Floppy disk, depending on the disk, it could be three to five or 10 to 20, but probably three to five, so not very long. CD and DVDs, five to 10 years for um, unrecorded and two to five for recorded, so pretty short. Blu-ray, two to five recorded, and hard disk drives, three to five years. Flash storage, five to 10 years, depending on the drive type, so five is not, very long, is it? So you've got to sort of think to yourself five years is probably a good time to review or even less than that. So here's the how-to tips I promised you. Um, the beauty and challenge of looking after archives and their unique quality is that everyone's personal collections will be both special to them and totally unique. The way we collect our personal memories, what we collect initially and what we want to keep, both digital and analogue, is unique to us and will be a unique process in the same way. So I'm offering a beginning point today, so this is just the beginning, <laughs> there's a lot more to it, um, for you as individuals embarking on your personal digital archiving projects. And the following how-to tips, they're not really intended to be an exhaustive list, but just somewhere to start um, and think about when you're thinking about your inventory. Um, yeah, so not every digital format is covered, but it'll take you there if you want to keep searching within the, the links. It's important to note that individuals might need additional information for planning and advice regarding specific larger or any kind of projects. So yeah, just, just as a guide here. And for more detailed information, we have a library guide now available to you on the State Library website, and it's full of useful info on how to care for your digital collections, and we're updating that as well. Um, so I'll go through some of these tabs across the top there. Um, so there's an examples here for tips and tricks on how to archive emails, transfer video from tapes, DVDs or cameras, and how to transfer photos from your camera to your computer. And they also provide step-by-step -step processes that I've talked about today. Okay, so this one is photos have rich meaning and photos are unique. If they're lost, the information they provide can never be replaced. So when you get onto your website, there's some uh, PDF links in there which give you a how-to step-through guide. Um, also got video, 
technical file quality is an important consideration for digital video. Videos that are posted on the web, for example, often have grainy, poor quality. And I've explained that about Facebook photos on the web. They have a less um, uh, pure quality because they're stripped of the stuff strips out of them and because they have a lot less information than the original version. So always go for your highest quality versions of your videos um, with good descriptive information too. Uh, digital audio. Uh, you may have many digital audio files, music, lectures, other sound recordings. Some of these have personal, financial or other value that leaves you to keep them for a long time. You should make uh, sure that audio files you select for saving are in an open file format. So this will ensure the greatest flexibility. So open file format is the definite recommendation. Email. And this is a big one for me that I need to work on too. So like paper letters, your email messages document important events, transactions, relationships, could be anything. And saving an email involves keeping it separate from your email program. So if you're using Gmail or those kind of um, programs, save them separately from that. That's because email programs are not meant to keep information for a really long time. They're not there forever, basically. And they can change or they can just stop providing support at any time. So the ones you want to save out of your email, take them and save them into your um, saving uh, uh, cycle of saving things as you do your other files. So documents, you've probably got resumes, school papers, uni papers like I have, um, financial spreadsheets perhaps, presentation slides like these or other digital documents. You might also have digital copies of original hard copy documents such as letters, maps or family histories, genealogical histories. Some of this information may have enduring value and for this type of information it's important to decide which documents to save. You might not want to save all of that. Think about different versions such as drafts and earlier copies so sometimes a draft can have more information about how you've created that file than the final piece itself. You might have annotations and things in that that are interesting that you'd like to save along with the final file. Um, and we're getting there. So social media and websites. We mentioned websites earlier, we mentioned at the back. So if you have a blog, website, Facebook page or other way to share information on the internet, you also have a rich source of information that you should think about saving for the future. For this category, you need to start any archiving process first, identifying what you have, and we talked about that, identifying the file formats in that. You might have multiple places where you share this information too. So uh, do you consider all of those, or are you just going to only save your blogs, or will you also save all of your Facebook um, posts as well? Think about that if you want to save all of that. Now, we did mention donations earlier, so um, I'll, uh, that's what this kind of brings me to this as well. All of that chatter brings me along to this. Um, the library encourages members of the community, organisations and businesses to consider donating material to us for appraisal, especially South Australiana material, to increase the depth and range of the library's collections. Most of the library's letters, diaries, photographs, menus, wine labels, toys, as I mentioned, the toy, um, the play exhibition items, Games were donated by people who wish to see their items preserved for future generations to use. So not just their own families, but everyone, South Australian and beyond, of course. Um, now that you know how to organise your digital materials or you've had a, a little brief look into it, we'd love you to consider donating your papers to us. So, but, you know, you'll organise them all first, won't you, for me? That, that'll be nice, thanks. You can do all the work, <laughs> just joking. Well, you have an idea of, you know, what you need to do to prepare them for us to appraise them anyway. Um, and also on this website page, which you'll have access to, there's a digital donor pack. So there's a separate donation pack which will guide you through all the different file formats as well and how to prepare all of those if you are thinking about donating to us. And that will sort of be based on your inventory list that you might create too. So here's a fun slide coming up. Being able to access your material and share it with your friends and family is the reward for all your hard work that you've put into preserving your digital archives. But if all that's 
uh, seems too daunting. And if all else fails, when in doubt, print it out. That way you've, you've got your hard copy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've seen a big thumbs up in the front row there. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the, another way to, if you can't do any of that, print it. Then you've got your hard copy. Um, so just to wrap up, identify and choose. Don't keep everything. A little organisation goes a long way. Unless you really need to uh, keep everything. You don't need to keep everything. Um, make copies from your master files. Keep two copies in how many locations? Two, yes. And store in separate locations and start now. Start this afternoon. So thanks very much. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and if there are any other questions now, while well, we've got our expert data guru here as well. Please, ah oh yes, in the front. <laughs>